welcome back to Van's reading. We're on part eight, no, sorry, rule eight, part two. And you know the book Beyond Order by Jordan Peterson. Uh, the land you know, the land you do not know, and the land you cannot even imagine. You inhabit the land you know pragmatically and conceptually, but imagine what lies just outside of that. There exists an immense space of things you, don't, you do not know, but which other people might comprehend at least in part. Then outside of what anyone knows, there is the space of things that no one at all knows. Your world is known, ter your world is known territory, surrounded by the relatively unknown, surrounded by the absolutely unknown, surrounded even more distantly by the absolutely unknowable. Together, that is the can canonical archetypal landscape. The unknown manifests itself to you in the midst of the known that revelation sometimes exciting but often quite painful is the source of new knowledge but a fundamental question remains how is that knowledge generated what is comprehended and understandable does not just leap in one fell swoop from the absolutely unknown to the thoroughly and self-evidently articulated knowledge must pass through many stages of analysis a multitude of transformations before it becomes let us say commonplace the first stage is that of pure action reflects action at the most basic of levels. If something surprises you, you react to it first with your body. You crouch defensively or freeze or run away in panic. Those are all forms of representation and categorization in nascent form. Crouch means predatory attack. Freeze means predatory threat. Panic means terror necessitating escape. The world of possibility begins to actualize itself with such instinctual instinct instinctual embodied action unconscious and uncontrollable the first realization of possibility of potential it's not conceptual it is embodied but it is still representational it is no longer the thing in itself we referred to earlier but the transmutation of that thing into common commensurate physical response that is representation maybe you are at home, at night, assume you are alone, it is dark and late, and an unexpected noise startles you, and you freeze. That is the first transmutation and known noise, a pattern to frozen position, then your heart rate rises in preparation for unspecified action. That is the second transmutation, you are preparing to move. Next, your imagination populates the darkness with whatever might be making the noise. That is the third transmutation part of a complete and practical sequence. Embodied responses, freezing and heart rate increase. And then imagistic, I think imagistic, imagistic, imaginative representation. The latter is part of explore, exploration, which you might extend by overcoming your terror and the freezing associated with it. Assuming nothing else to unexpected happens and investigating the locale once part of your friendly house from where the noise appeared to emanate. You have now engaged in active explore, exploration, a precursor to direct perception. Hopefully nothing too dramatic, then to explicit knowledge of the source and then back to routine and complacent peace if the noise proves to be nothing of significance. That is how information moves from the unknown to the known, except that sometimes the noise, <clears throat> except that sometimes the noise does not prove insignificant. Then there is trouble. Artists are the people who stand on the frontier of the transformation of the unknown into knowledge. They make their voluntarily for A out into the unknown and they take a piece of it and transform it into an image. Maybe they do it through choreography and dance. Choreography, let me see that. Maybe they do it through choreography and dance by representing the manifestation of the world in physical display, com communicable although not in words to others. Maybe they do it by acting, which is a sophisticated form of embodiment and imitation, or by painting or sculpting. Perhaps they manage it through screenwriting or by penning a novel. After all that come the intellectuals with philosophy and criticism, abstracting and articulating the work's representations and rules, consider the role that Creative people play in cities. They are typically starving a bit because it is virtually impossible to be commercially successful as an artist. And that hunger is partly what motivates them. Do not underestimate the utility of necessity. In their poverty, they explore the city and they discover some ratty, quasi-criminal area that has been that has seen better days. They visit, look, 
they visit, look and poke about and they think, you know, with a little work, this area could be cool. Then they move on and piece together some galleries and put up some art. They do not make any money, but they civilize the space a bit. In doing so, they elevate and transform what is too dangerous into something cutting edge. Then a coffee shop pops up and maybe an unconventional clothing store. The next thing you know, the, the what is it called? gentrifiers move in. They are creative types too, but more conservative, less desperate, perhaps more risk averse at least. So they are not the first ones on the edge of the frontier. Then the developers show up and then the chain stores appear and the middle of the middle or upper class establishes itself, uh, itself. Then the artists have to move because they can, no, they can no longer afford the rent. That is a loss for the avant-garde, but it is okay even though it is harsh because with all that stability and predictability, the artists should not be there anymore. They need to rejuvenate some other area. They need another vista to conquer. That is their natural environment. That edge where artists are always transforming chaos into all that can be very rough and dangerous place. Living there, an artist constantly risks falling fully into the chaos instead of transforming it. But artists have always lived there on the border of human understanding. Art bears the same relationship to society that the dream bears to mental life. You're very creative when you're dreaming. This is why when you remember a dream, you think, where in the world did that come from? It is very strange and incomprehensible that something can happen in your head and you have no idea how it got there or what it means. It is, it is a miracle, nature's voice manifesting itself in your psyche. And it happens every night, like art, the dream mediates between order and chaos. So it is half chaos. That is why it is not comprehensible. It is a vision, not fully fledged, articulated production. Those who actualize those half born visions into artistic productions are those who begin to transform what we do not understand into what we can at least start to see. That is the role of the artist are occupying the vanguard. That is their biological niche. They are the initial civilizing agents. The artists do not understand full well that the artists do not understand full well what they are doing. They cannot. If they are doing something genuinely new, otherwise they could just say what they mean and have done with it. They would not require expression in dance, music, and image, but they are guided by feel by intuition by the facility with the detection of patterns and that is all embodied rather than articulated at least in its initial stages when creating the artists are struggling contending and wrestling with a problem maybe even a problem they do not fully understand and striving to bring something new into clear focus otherwise they are mere propagandists reversing the artistic process attempting to transform something they can already articulate into image and art for the purpose of rhetorical and ideologic, ideological victory. That is a great sin, harnessing the higher for the purpose of our, purposes of the lower. It is totalitarian tactic, the subordination of art and literature to politics, or the purposeful blurring of the distinction between them. Artists must be contending with something they do not understand, or they are not artists. Instead, they are poses or romantics, often romantic failures or narcissists or actors and not in the creative sense. They are likely when genuine to be idiosyncratically and peculiarly, uh, I love this word is hard, peculiarly obsessed by their intuition, possessed by it, willing to pursue it even in the face of opposition and the overwhelming likelihood of rejection, criticism and practical and financial failure. When they are, are successful, they make the world more understandable, sometimes replacing something more understood. But now, an anachron oh, this is a tough word, but now anachronis anachronistic, anachronistic, with something new and better, they move the unknown closer to the conscious, social, and articulated world. And then people gaze at those artworks, watch the dramas, and listen to the stories, and they start to become informed by them, but they do not know how or why, and people find great value in it more value perhaps than in anything else there is good reason that most expensive artifacts in the world those that are literally or close to literally priceless are great works of art i once visited the Me Me metropolitan museum of art in new york uh, it contained a collection of great and famous renaissance paintings each worth hundreds of millions do millions of dollars assuming they were ever made available for purchase 
The area containing them was a shrine, a place of divine for believers and atheists alike. It was the most expensive and prestigious of museums located on real estate of the highest quality and desire, desirability in what might well be the most active and exciting city in the world. The collection had been put together over a great expanse of time and with much difficulty. The gallery was packed with people, many of whom had voyaged there as part of what must be properly regarded as pilgrimage. I asked myself, what are these people up to coming to this place so carefully curated, traveling these great distances, looking at these paintings? And what do they believe they are up to? One painting featured the immaculate conception of Mary brilliantly composed. The mother of God was rising to heaven in a beatific state encapsulated in a mandorla of clouds embedded with the faces of pretty. Many of the people gathered were gazing enraptured at the work. I thought they do not know what that painting means. They do not understand the symbolic meaning of the mandorla or, or the significance of the putti or the idea of the glorification of the mother of God and God of all is dead or so goes the story. Why does the painting nonetheless retain its value? Why is it in this room, in this building with these other paintings in this city, carefully guarded, not to be touched? Why is this painting and all these others beyond price and desired by those who already have everything? Why are these creations stored so carefully in, modern, in a modern shrine and visited by people from all over the world as if it were a duty, even as if it were desirable or necessary? We treat these objects as if they were sacred, at least that it is at least that is what our actions in their vicinity suggest. We gaze at them in ignorance. We gaze at them in ignorance and wonder and remember what we have forgotten. Perceiving ever so dimly what can no longer see, what we what we are perhaps no longer willing to see. The unknown shrines, the unknown shines through the production of great artists in partially articulated form. The way inspiring and ineffable begins to be realized, but retains a terrifying abundance of its transcendent power. That is the role of art, and that is the role of artists. It is no wonder we keep their dangerous magical productions locked up, framed, and apart from everything else. And if a great piece is damaged anywhere, the news spreads, the news spreads worldwide. We feel a tremor run through the bedrock of our culture, the dream upon which our reality depends shakes and moves we find ourselves unnerved okay so that'll be part two of rule eight which is an interesting thing which i like i like the idea that he points out that artists are basically putting something chaotic in some sensical form for us to understand and maybe give us a feeling or some kind of uh recognition and that's uh, to, to us, there's something that we recognize and that allows us to maybe make sense of some kind of chaos and dreams and reality in some sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a pretty interesting part of the chapter. Nothing too important. I mean, it's important in the sense of why do we have movies? Why do we have art? Why do we have everything else that is important? I think that maybe, maybe... The question is why do we need because like what else do we do when we're bored right we watch movies what else do we do when we look for answers we we look to other creativity <clears throat> we look to other images in order to understand this feeling that you're feeling or maybe avoid a feeling or maybe look for better information to make sense of something that or ignore something you know which is interesting and that's cool that is an under that's a I think is a good thing for people to get away from. Like, you know, you get a look at a painting and you you're just amazed by why it looks or some stupid thing like yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not an art guy, but maybe something you saw and you're like, wow, I gotta I gotta look at this for a while because it's making me interested in it and I don't understand why. And it's making me feel something nice or good or you watch a TV show, it makes you laugh. If you watch a really good movie and you're like, wow, that was really interesting and different and captivating. And you want to understand why. And what's interesting, I've been learning a lot about like movies lately. And what you see is like the actual coloring and the, the photography and the, you know, and, and everybody, like, everybody thinks it's cinema photography, but it's more where these photographies are inspired by 
the, the images and you know what i would you start to see is these cinematographies are cinematographers are like they're actually photographers looking at pictures and they get inspired by you know the coolness of an image or maybe the loneliness of an image or they may be like they talk about how this part of the image makes them feel in that certain way and it's so interesting it's like wait a minute they there's somehow an image a specific image can create an emotion because someone was there before and that's in, that's super interesting it, or maybe not someone was there but like the brain recognizes that that like certain parts of it's like look at this slight darkness of something like that it, it, it kind of inspires and so or maybe the the excitement of the color within this or the sun or the whatever it is it, like it's it's some kind of inspiration and and you see the, these artists coming together and they make technically music in a way when the music sounds good it sounds like it's in a rhythm and that's what movies are in a certain way as well and maybe imagery as well maybe paintings using colors and it, it's all some kind of like song in a certain way it all meshes together perfectly and it doesn't matter if it's complicated yet it just depends if it's out there it's something you know it's a feeling of something which inspires lots of people to do things you know and so that, that, that's an interesting thing and so maybe i think if we look at artists today and what is their main goal it's to inspire it's to make people move to go somewhere to maybe remind them of doing something or maybe remind them of a memory or you know have some kind of inspiration and, and it does many things it makes you angry you can do anything and that's what's so beautiful i mean what's interesting about art is that it guides you if you need some guidance you know what i mean and i mean sure like this what about the guidance i'm, I'm, I'm talking about more maybe i'm talking more romantically but there is something that when you look at art there's something or something like art uh you get some kind of fantasy or maybe some kind of idea or you know there is some kind of movement going on in your pattern of thinking and that's what matters that's what art does anyway so that's and it's also dependent on the individual you know certain art doesn't mix with someone because of the specific experiences so yeah anyway that's the last thing i'm gonna say which is interesting uh as well, i say it's always interesting <laughs> uh yeah but yeah that's all i'm gonna say anyway end of part two uh, rule eight Thanks for watching.